science and technology development science and technology development science technology development science technology development in all of this science technology and development we seem to be moving along just fine Humanity is progressing towards a new age of civilization. Just look at all the science, technology, development. Then one begins to look, and not at all the science, technology, and development. Rather, this one looks straight into the soul behind the thick shadow of outer progress. As we continue to strive to master the world, explore the cosmos, one must ask, what about the psyche? What about consciousness? What is the purpose of outer progress if there is no soul in the matter? One rare scientist, mystic, or just a mere curious individual looked into a different direction than almost all around him. Carl Jung knew what was most important in life, and he made it his life work to provide an honest, objective account on it. Before everything which we know as analytical or Jungian psychology was presented, he experienced the raw nature of the psyche itself. In his confrontation with the unconscious, as he calls it, Jung records his raw inner experiences in various black books, and it is in the final book, Black Book 7, where we find sets of ruins which arise from within Jung's own depths. A set of ruins without a connection to any known symbolic language. As the translators of the Black Books wrote, neither Nordic Germanic ruins or Egyptian hieroglyphs command the field, but something other. The language has never been taught before, even during the first four years or so of Jung's experiment. So it is through the obscure where we're headed, away from the so-called progress of today, so we may glimpse into what the so-called has distracted us from. Because it is in the obscure, individual by individual, where life and meaning are found. I bring forth a video on the ruins to highlight not only the ruins themselves, but the reality of the depths of the psyche. Specifically what Jung calls the unconscious. A hidden deep layer of consciousness unfamiliar to those playing on its surface. And in order to grasp its energetic movement, its expressions, its hidden meaning, one must respect its symbolic language. An obscure language and movement Jung spent his life uncovering. In his final work, Man and His Symbols, Jung concludes part one, the only section in this work attributed to him, stating, I have spent more than a half a century in investigating natural symbols, and I have come to the conclusion that dreams and their symbols are not stupid and meaningless. On the contrary, dreams provide the most interesting information for those who take the trouble to understand their symbols. The result, it is true, have little to do with such worldly concerns as buying and selling. But the meaning of life is not exhaustively explained by one's business life, nor is the deep desire of the human heart answered by a bank account. In a period of human history when all available energy is spent in the investigation of nature, very little attention is paid to the essence of man, which is his psyche, although many researches have been made into its conscious functions. But the really complex and unfamiliar part of the mind, from which symbols are produced, is still virtually unexplored. As Jung says, this space is complex and unfamiliar. While I'm not attempting to provide you the keys to the unconscious, to give you a master symbol to grasp all symbols, our journey into the ruins will uncover deep insights into the nature of the psyche, specifically its enigmatic expression. But before getting into the ruins, it is wise to gain background context on their arrival. First, we must look at the essence of the unconscious, specifically its symbolic language. Additionally, two figures show up in Jung's Black Book entries. The first is a black magician named Ha, who, if one is familiar with the Red Book, is the father of Philemon. 
and it is Ha who provides the runes, as well as his translation, which will be the feature of this video. While Ha provides the runes, it is Ha's soul, the shadow of Philemon, who provides Ha the runes. This figure is named Ka, and plays a more significant role at the end of the Black Books. Following this, we will explore the runes. I have set this portion of the video up so that Ha's translations show up with the symbol or symbols in discussion, making an easy, pleasant visual and audio journey through the runes. To conclude, I'll provide a few key points to highlight without providing any full translation on these runes. I believe it's best for all, especially individual consciousness, to work through these runes and come to the meaning on its own. And when I say work through them, I don't mean consciously figuring them out, but rather letting them work through you. So with our path set, let's begin our approach. For it is the function of consciousness not only to recognize and assimilate the external world through the gateway of the senses, but to translate into visible reality the world within us. A high regard for the unconscious psyche as a source of knowledge is not nearly such a delusion as our Western rationalism likes to suppose. We are inclined to assume that in the last resort, all knowledge comes from without. Yet today, we know for certain that the unconscious has contents which would bring an immeasurable increase of knowledge if they could only be made conscious. We begin with respect for the depths. It would be an injustice to the unconscious to just flash up these runes and provide mere opinions to their meaning. It is equally unjust to speak about this space without grasping its symbol-making ability. It was in the introduction where I quoted the translators to the Black Books, remarking these runes have no known connection to anything recorded in history. With this fact, we see the unconscious speaking on its own terms, that is, symbolically. Take the symbols too literally, and you've trapped yourself. Ignore them, and you risk the unpleasant experience of witnessing its expression without. As Jung says, the psychological rule says that when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside, as fate. That is to say, when the individual remains undivided and does not become conscious of his inner opposite, the world must perforce act out the conflict and be torn into opposing halves. Just as it does in a dream, the unconscious uses a medium to convey its message, and that medium is symbolic. Jung says that the psychological mechanism which transforms energy is the symbol, transferring, say, a potential latent unconscious energy into a form that can be experienced in conscious awareness. This symbol, the form, the medium, comes in all different modes of expression. Words are symbols, dreams are symbols, and so are specific shapes like runes. And while it's not a dream which these runes came through Jung, rather his active imagination, it is all the same process of transference, of inner communion. It is said runes are the oldest scripted signs of the ancient Germans, and the word rune means secret in High Middle German. While these runes are not related to the ancient Germans, or hieroglyphs from Egypt, or cuneiform pictographs from Mesopotamia, or Chinese ideograms, they are not to be thrown aside as some hallucination. Rather, it should be viewed as a secret form of communication, oneself to oneself, as the term communication means to share or be in relation with. It's truly a self-communion. In the outer world, we communicate by speaking, writing, typing, and texting words an arrangement of certain characters or letters which come together to form a specific message, a meaning. To understand the sentence is not only to grasp each word in itself, but also how they all come together as a whole. But of course, words can only do so much. I'm sure you've had a time when you wanted to express something, but couldn't seem to find the right words. 
Additionally, words lose their magic, the essence they point to, when consciousness, specifically ego consciousness, distorts the meaning of them. Jung speaks about this in the Red Book, as an inner figure, the solitary one, speaks. I dug up old runes and magical sayings, for words never reach men. Words have become shadows. The beauty about the runes is that they are completely unknown and foreign. They're like a dream. It takes another sense of logic to interpret. A sense of logic that we've lost in the West. This logic, which is grasping a chaos and finding a hidden order, is something Jung spent his life developing. He speaks on interpreting dreams in symbolic language in two quotes from his collective works. As for an attitude to go into the unknown, Jung states in collective work 18, The Symbolic Life, Therefore, first of all, when you handle a dream, you say, I don't understand a word of that dream. I always welcome that feeling of incompetence, because then I know I shall put some good work into my attempt to understand the dream. What I do is this. I adopt the method of the philologist, which is far from being free association, and apply a logical principle which is called amplification. It is simply that of seeking the parallels. That is how we learned how to read hieroglyphics and cuneiform inscriptions. And that is how we can read dreams. Jung then adds in his collective work 17, Development of Personality. Coming now to the much disputed question of dream analysis, we proceed in a manner not unlike that employed in the deciphering of hieroglyphs. First, we assemble all the available material which the dreamer himself can give as regards the dream images. We next exclude any statements that depend upon particular theoretical assumptions, for those are generally quite arbitrary attempts at interpretation. We then inquire into the happenings of the previous day, as well as into the mood and the general plans and purpose of the dreamer in the days and weeks preceding the dream. A more or less intimate knowledge of his circumstances and character is of course a necessary prerequisite. Great care and attention must be given to this preparatory work if we want to get at the meaning of the dream. I have no faith in dream interpretations made on the spur of the moment and concocted out of some preconceived theory. Overall, through these two quotes, there are four points to quickly highlight. Points not only relevant for approaching these runes, but also approaching your own runes, your own inner symbolism. First, and I'd say most important, is that attitude to take when approaching something obscure and unknown. If you have your own theories, your own beliefs, your own prior convictions that X means Y is happening, that this symbol has this meaning, or any other assumptions, then the work can never begin. You get in the way. There's a sense of pure awareness necessary before any meaning may be extracted, an awareness that respects the symbol in itself, as it is. Next, Jung says to assemble all available material from the dream or symbol. While some moments or images may stand out, it is wise to capture the whole before looking at the parts. If not, you'll never have all the necessary parts to grasp the whole. In this video, not only will we be able to see all the runes, but also an interpretation of them by a figure in Jung's vision. Additionally, on this point, Jung speaks about applying a logical principle called amplification. This is a practice of finding parallels to the unconscious content coming through consciousness within mythology, religion, fairy tales, or other historical content which stimulates a certain collective archetype that may explain the ambiguous content. Jung writes in Psychology and Alchemy, This is why, in analytical psychology, we resort to amplification in the interpretation of dreams. For a dream is too slender a hint to be understood until it is enriched by the stuff of association and analogy, and thus amplified to the point of intelligibility. Another point to highlight is this look into the happenings of the previous day, as well as the mood, plans, and purpose 
of the dreamer in the days or weeks preceding the dream. As for Jung, he was on military service four months before this entry, so not much background information will be available. And the final point to add is that one must have great care and attention, as well as patience, to allow the meaning to come forth. This care requires a discipline to trust the process and not distort its unfoldment into consciousness. While an ego may want to get its hands dirty and solve the puzzle, the true meaning reveals itself in pure soil. One should be aware, tend the content, amplify it a bit, but should remain detached as if it were a seed growing within their consciousness. But remember, if you place this seed in a consciousness with hard-line beliefs and opinions, then the seed will be choked off and wither. Again, and this is my opinion, but through my own experience, only pure consciousness will allow that true seed to blossom. So with these four general points on how to approach anything obscure, as well as some background information on the symbolic language of the unconscious, we must explore two figures from Black Book 7 who are responsible for the runes. Philemon and other figures of my fantasies brought home to me the critical insight that there are things in the psyche which I do not produce, but which produce themselves and have their own life. The figures of the unconscious are uninformed and need man or contact with consciousness in order to obtain knowledge. Through Jung's visionary experiences, various figures arise, representing different personality forms and movements in one's unconscious mind, say the archetypes, which have provided Jung light throughout his inner journey. And while Jung's figures may not be your specific forms, it is their essence which lies within the collective of all. As I quickly discuss these two figures tied to the runes, keep your eye not only on their names and form, but also, and more importantly, on their essence. See if you can catch these unconscious essences or archetypes within you. The first figure to examine is Ha, the black magician, the interpreter of the runes. October 7th, 1917. This entry begins after Jung was on military service from June 11th to October 2nd during World War I. He begins as he speaks to his soul. My soul, offerings have been brought. Willingness is attested. Submission has taken place. Soul, I see and accept it. You have done what was required and you will do what is still required. Go your way without doubts. Any way that opens, according to your ability. Jung. Yet now, what was it? Someone stood at the corner at night. What does he want, and who was he? His soul responds, A darker spirit, a spirit of deception, a sorcerer of Satan, an adept of the blackest magic. Jung then asks his soul to let this darker spirit speak. Jung's soul says to Ha, the magician, Listen, darker son of ancient earth, nephew of mother's mud, I call you. Come to the light of day. Ha comes into the light, that is Jung's consciousness, and responds, Here I am. Surely you have not seen anyone like me. Surely I'm necessary, Philemon. My son is probably too weak. Should I help? What do you pay? So already we have a feel for this figure. It approached as if a shadow within Jung, standing in the corner at night, and his soul says that it's a darker son of ancient earth, a spirit of deception, and an adept of the blackest magic. This all points to a rather earthly, shadow side of life. Another significant point to highlight, for those familiar with the Red Book, is Ha himself says he's the father of Philemon. Here we see our first connection between this darker, earthly figure connected with the lighter, heavenly figure in Philemon. More on this connection will follow. One final point to add before continuing with Ha is the fact that Jung asks his soul to speak to him, 
as if Jung can't speak to it without his soul. He asks, she calls, and Ha comes through. After Jung's soul says, you are too black, too much of midnight, too dreadfully earthy, then follows, we don't want to be stared to death by you. She finally gets Ha to reveal some information as to why he's making his presence known to Jung. What I want, do you really want to know? I feel like strangling. Yes, strangling. Does that please you? I feel like strangling a man. This all leads to more information about this event. There's a footnote in which describes Jung during this episode. I was writing in my book and suddenly saw a man standing watching over my shoulder. One of the gold dots from my book flew up and hit him in the eye. He asked me if I would take it out. I said no, not unless he told me who he was. He said he wouldn't. You see, I knew that. If I had done what he had asked, then he would have sunk into the unconscious and I would have missed the point of it, i.e. why he had appeared from the unconscious at all. Finally, he told me that he would tell me the meaning of certain hieroglyphs, which I had had a few days earlier. This he did, and I took the thing out of his eye, and he vanished. This entry continues with the inner dialogue between Ha and Jung's soul that expands on this footnote, and we will pick back up on it moments before the ruins arise. So after this brief feel for Jung's Ha, the true essence of the ruins lies in Ka. October 22nd, 1917. Just as the human is nothing without a soul, Ha is nothing without its own soul. It's rather interesting to see inner figures in the unconscious having souls, but this is not the only paradox of this pair. Ka is described as Philemon's shadow, showing the opposites of light and shadow and effect in form within Jung. Jung's own soul says to him, This attracts the dead, if I'm too needy. They draw me away from you. There's one in this neighborhood, the black magician's brother. He prowls around me. Jung answers, What does he want? His soul responds, I don't know what he has or wants. Jung then commands, So then ask him. His soul in response asks the dark figure, What do you want, black one? Come closer and speak. Before continuing, I want to expand on an earlier insight, and it's how these unconscious figures are felt. The ego, say Jung himself, consciously senses Ha when this energy was first felt. Ka, on the other hand, is not sensed by Jung, but through his soul. This is an important note for anyone doing their inner work. As if they think they can power through it all, they are mistaken. True inner work requires other senses than what we can consciously will. And as we will see, without getting to the roots of something, you'll never wholly grasp a thing. And I am not saying to lose will, that it's evil, as of course it's an important part of the work. Without Jung's conscious will, he would never notice Ha, which may never lead to Ka. But there are other things outside will, which one must allow to come through, must bow to, to be whole. To Jung's soul, the dark figure Ka responds, I am the commencement of the soul. I am Ha, but his other side. I am his soul. I gave him the runes and the lower wisdom. I am his spirit. He is gone and I remain. I want to be with you. Jung then asks his soul, what is the uncanny companion to us? To which she asks Ka, what do you want with us? Ka answers, you must have me, for you will still need me. Ha knows the outer. I, the inner. He has poverty. I, wealth. What does he know? Just his boring story of cones and suns and serpents. Poultry roans. A golden seed burns in his eye. But my eyes are of sheer gold. My body is black iron. I am heavy and lasts for eternities. I know the meaning of the roans. 
Pa blabbers about them like a child. Just as in a dream, one can point out various signs, forms, and symbols, but the true hidden meaning is just below the surface. And Ka is just this below. As we get into the ruins, Ha will go on just as Ka says, offering some key points to note. But as you will see, there is much more work to be done to grasp the ruins. A level of insight which is of the essence of Ka. The entry continues as Jung interjects. Be careful, my soul. He is uncanny. He is exceedingly clever. So, you still come without a request? What do you want? Ka, I ask for nothing more than I can accompany you. Jung, I mistrust him. Soul, I think that you should let him come along. What Ha said was not utterly stupid. In his own way, it was even arcly clever, though blasphemous. I admit that. Young Soul then asked Ka, Are you hiding evil in your black heart? Ka, No, I don't even have a heart. I am iron through and through. I'm cold, that's all. Maybe that's something you can use. Soul, Did you hear? He's cold and clever. Wouldn't that be useful? Yonk, so let him come along if he tells you what he knows. Soul, listen, Ka, you may come along on condition that you teach us what you know. Ka, I know what you need. You need my mystery. My mystery is the essence of all magic, and that is love. You are too warm. How could you radiate love? You have it in you. It does not radiate to others. What does the ancient one in the white cloak say to you? He speaks love and does not speak of it. Listen, man. You let yourself be robbed by your soul. She forces you to give love. Then she rules. Above all, she wants to rule. Do not give too much love. Look at your goal and not at love. Then you will radiate love. Does Philemon have love? No. He radiates it. Let me come along. I give you coldness, which generates the warm radiance. The entry continues with Jung asking his soul to see what Philemon has to say about this, to which Philemon joins the dialogue between Jung, his soul, and Ka. It is a beautiful exchange between the light in Philemon and its shadow in Ka, but for the purposes of the runes, I want to keep focus on the essence of Ka, as a lengthy footnote provides key context. In memories, Jung recalled, later Philemon became relativized by the emergence of yet another figure, whom I called Ka. In ancient Egypt, the king's Ka was his earthly form, the embodied soul. In my fantasy, the Ka soul came from below, came out of the earth, as if out of a deep shaft. I did a painting of him, showing him in his earthbound form, as a herm with a base of stone and upper part of bronze. High up in the painting appears a kingfisher's wing, and between it, and the head of Ka floats around, glowing nebula of stars. Ka's expression has something demonic about it. One might also say Mephistophelian. In one hand, he holds something like a colored pagoda or a reliquary, and in the other, a stylus with which he is working on the reliquary. He is saying, I am the one who buries the gods in golden gems. Philemon has a lame foot, but was a winged spirit, whereas Ka represented a kind of earth demon or metal demon. Philemon was the spiritual aspect or meaning. Ka, on the other hand, was a spirit of nature like the Anthroparian of Greek alchemy, with which at the time I was still unfamiliar. Ka was he who made everything real, but who also obscured the halcyon spirit, the meaning, or replaced it by beauty, the eternal reflection. In time, I was able to integrate both figures through the study of alchemy. The footnote continues, In 1928, Jung commented, at a rather higher stage of development, 
where the idea of the soul already exists, not all the images continue to be projected, but one or the other complex has come near enough to consciousness to be felt as no longer a stranger, but as somehow belonging. Nevertheless, the feeling that it belongs is not at first sufficiently strong for the complex to be sensed as a subjective content of consciousness. It remains in a sort of no man's land, between consciousness and the unconscious, in the half shadow, in part belonging or inclined to the conscious subject, in part an autonomous being, and meeting consciousness as such. At all events, it is not necessarily obedient to the subject's intentions. It may even be of a higher order, more often than not a source of inspiration or warning or of supernatural information. Psychologically, such a content can be explained as a partly autonomous complex that is not yet fully integrated. The primitive souls, the Egyptian Ba and Ka, are complexes of this kind. And a final piece of this footnote concludes with notes from Constance Long from a discussion with Jung focused on his understanding of the relation between Philemon and Ka. The two figures on either side are personifications of dominant fathers. One is the creative father, Ka, the other, Philemon, that one who gives form and law, the formative instinct. Ka would equal Dionysus, Philemon, Apollo. Philemon gives formation to the things within elements of the collective unconscious. Philemon gives the idea, maybe of a god, but remains floating, distant, and indistinct because all the things he invents are winged. But Ka gives substance and is called the one who buries the gods in gold and marble. He has a tendency to misprison them in matter, and so they are in danger of losing their spiritual meaning and becoming buried in stone. So the temple may be the grave of God as the church has become the grave of XT. The more the church develops, the more XT dies. Ka must not be allowed to produce too much. You must not depend on substination. But if too little substance is produced, the creature floats. Ka is sensation, Philemon is intuition. He is too superhuman. He is Zarathustra, extravagantly superior in what he says, and cold. While I can go on about Ka, and I wouldn't be surprised to see his presence in future videos, I do want to highlight this connection between Ka and Philemon. They are two sides to the same coin, opposites, where Ka represents an earthly, darker wisdom, Philemon presenting a heavenly, lighter wisdom. Philemon produces an idea, and Ka produces its substance. In this entry, as Jung's soul is in discussion with Ka, Philemon provides his thoughts on Ka. Ka is my shadow. How could you do without him? Ka may go with you as I do. There is no one above who does not have his shadow below. My light is strong and my shadow is dark. And to come full circle with this Philemon and Ka connection, we find them show up in a mandala Jung added in his commentary on the secret life of the golden flower, an image that he reproduced from his patient during treatment. This mandala is also found in his paper called Concerning Mandala Symbolism where he wrote, the old man corresponds to the archetype of meaning or of the spirit and the dark chthonic figure to the opposite of the old wise man, namely the magical and sometimes destructive Luciferian element. And to add to this mandala in Black Book One, where this image and quote are found, there's a sentence which concludes, the figure at the top is Philemon and the figure at the bottom is Ka. Now to close out this background on Ka, I want to read the end of this entry which Ka first makes his presence known, a foreshadow to the ruins of which we're about to explore. After Philemon provides his thoughts on Ka to Jung and his soul, he and his shadow begin to bicker back and forth, to which Ka asks Philemon, am I bound to you forever? To which he then asks Jung, won't you place yourself between me and Philemon? Jung's soul says to Jung, Don't do it. Think of the ruins. 
Jung replies, O my faithful, beloved soul, do you know where my place is? You daughter of the mother, I recognize your motherly love. You really don't want to release me, but you know, you will be where I am. I say yes or no, and you are always there. Let me decide, for the sake of eternal beauty, am I not the seed that lie between shadow and light? How can I be a man differently? How can I love man differently? My kind? My kingdom is earth and my kingdom is heaven. How can I find peace if heaven and earth plummeted into one another? Let the eternal runes be fulfilled. Mine is the light and the darkness. The one which I unknowingly received, Philemon gave back. The other which I unknowingly was, the shadow will take. The third belongs to me and is my life. Philemon, my son, blessed be your life. Ka, my son, blessed be your life. With Ha and Ka in mind, we return back to October 7th, 1917, as we remember the footnote describing a gold seed stuck in Ha's eye. Only Jung's soul can get it out. But she is holding off until Ha reveals his secret, his science, the runes. Soul, it burns you. Let it go. Ha, I can't understand despite the fact that you often saw it. It's the runes. I know them. They are my work, my science. Soul, that's it. That's what I want. That's what you have to teach us. Ha, no, never ever. Soul, I wait. Otherwise you won't be released. Ha, you devil. Why should that be? The runes belong to me and no one else. You are too stupid. I alone understand them. What if you understood that? I won't give them up. Never ever. Soul, does the grain of sand burn you? Ha, I can't deny it. But the runes? You can't use them anyway. Too damn smart a science for you. Look here, these snatches. What do you want with this? And there is still a lot to them. Yong So continues pushing Ha. You should read that to us. Ha. Do I know how? I can't. Should I? You won't believe me. But look. The two diagonals lead to the circle. A straight line stands at the bridge and makes a step downwards and crawls like a serpent over two suns. It then goes straight downward and coils itself and imitates the upper cone, and has the sun in its belly. This is underlined twice because it is important, and behind it is a straight halt. After that, it stretches out two arms, and would like to stand firm, straight, and draw out two suns toward it. That's dirty, isn't it? But the lower cone has the dark sun in its belly, and therefore one is horrified by it. If it was a wheel which bore the cross in it, it would stand still and still take the way of the serpent around the two suns. That's what it says. Young Soul continues to push Ha for more. Explain. That is incomprehensible. Ha, you lack dirt. Your understanding has no dung in it. The two diagonals, however, are you yourself. The circle is the sun. One has the sun, the other doesn't. That's why you are diagonal. However, there must be one that stands straight and goes over the bridge. But that leaves the two suns behind it and becomes straight. That's why it has to go under again and coil around itself. Then it has the sun in the belly of the upper cone. It would stay longer with this, but the other longs for the second sun. But the other sun is dark in the belly of the lower cone. You see that he who is horrified at himself has the sun as a head and as a wheel is entirely sun and goes straight on the serpent's way 
and is no longer straight above, but a small tail upward. That is funny. Have you learned something? Yong Sol answers, that is something, but you already sent us runes earlier. You must read these to us. Ha. Damn, you make me think, but I am not stupid. I am much cleverer than you. See the two with different feet, one earth foot and one sun foot, which reach towards the upper cone and have the sun inside? But I have made one crooked line towards the other sun. Therefore one must reach downward. Meanwhile the upper sun comes out of the cone and the cone gazes towards it, dejected about where it is going. One has to retrieve it with a hook and place it in the small prison. Then three must stand together, unite, and twirl up at the top, concentric. With this, they manage to free the sun from its prison again. Now you make a thick bottom and a roof where the sun sits safe at the top. But inside the house, the other sun has also risen. Therefore, you two are coiled up at the top and have made a roof over the prison again at the bottom, so that the upper sun does not get in between. The two suns always want to be together. I said so. Both the cones, each has a sun. You want to let them come together, because then you think that you could thus be one. You have now drawn up both suns and brought them to one another, and you lean towards the other side. That is important. But then there are simply two suns below, so therefore you have to go to the lower cone. Then you put the suns together there, but in the middle, neither above nor below, there are not four, but two. But the upper cone is below, and there is a thick roof above, and if you want to continue, you long to return with both arms. But you have a prison for two below, for both of you. Therefore you make a prison for the lower sun, and fall towards the other side, to get the lower sun out of the prison. This is what you would like back and the upper cone comes and makes a bridge towards the lower, takes back its sun into it, which had run away before, and the morning clouds already come into the lower cone, but its sun is beyond the line, invisible, horizon. Now you are one and happy that you have the sun above and long to be with it above, but you are imprisoned in the prison of the lower sun that now rises. There is a halt. Now you make something quadrilateral above, which you call thoughts, a doorless prison with thick walls, so that the upper sun does not leave, but the cone is already gone. You lean towards the other side, long towards the below, and coil up at the bottom. Then you were one, and make the serpent sway between the suns. That is amusing, and important. But because it was amusing below, there is a roof above, and you must raise the hook upwards with both arms, so that it goes through the roof. Then the sun below is free, and there is a prison above. You look downward, but the upper sun looks towards you. But you stand as a pair and have detached the serpent from you. It is probably ruined for you. Therefore you make a prison for the below. Now the serpent crosses the sky above the earth for itself. You are driven completely apart. The serpent wriggles its way throughout the sky, all around the stars far above the earth. At the bottom it says, the mother gave me this wisdom. Are you content? Yong Sol answers, not yet. We still have other signs, which you should read. Ha continues his interpretation. There you have the lower cone again and you want to bring the upper and lower suns together again. You yearn for that, but nostalgically. You put them both together and long to return. Then you make a roof above the lower cone, truly lock it up and get the suns back again and now bring them completely together. And with this, you yourself are doubled, i.e. instead of one, you are four and split. That is why you must fetch out the sun again, namely, towards the below, and from this the longing towards the above will grow in you. You lift yourself over the line of the earth and tumble over. 
That is why you long suddenly for the below and want to lift it up from the below because you hang from the upper line. You want to be one and stand straight. That is why you make a line in the middle. You walk on the earth and then up above and go into the sky. And as you go in this way, the serpent creeps towards you above all the stars. You are one, you hold the serpent by the tail with one hand, and with the other you hold the stars. Both are separate, thus you stand straight. And because you stand that way, an arc grows on you on the other side, since you were held back, towards the left. Now you make a great prison below, possibly for the stars, and a cradle above, possibly for the serpent. You press the lid on the prison. There you also have a prison above, and the sun, which is one, looks towards you. One of you is defiant and locked up below. The sun has a serpent's tail and is the serpent itself, and the other longs for the above and is not yet higher. The defiance of the below and the longing of the above come together. A roof above and a floor beneath, and you were one again. Or if you have managed to move the ark forward, you make a bridge below and move towards the above and toward the below from the center. Or you separate above and below, split the suns again and crawl like a serpent over the one above and receive the one below. You take with you what you have experienced and go forward to something new. The serpent crawls below and above the sun is locked up. The prison is open backwards, and therefore the serpent crawls forward, and rises and becomes straight, because you both are above. Now you take the sun within you, and press it below in the middle. Therefore you are split, which you don't like. Therefore you turn yourself forward, and await something other, and are one in there. You have separated above and below. The upper cone comes down there, and draws the sun toward it, and you creep up from below with great longing and are one. In that moment the upper cone becomes strong, since it has a young one, or you make a protection against it, and seek to make it small. Therefore you curl yourself towards the below. That pleases you, and you can't get well away from it. Therefore you must make a bridge towards being one, and look forward. Then comes the great one-footed one, and steps onto the serpent's way between the two suns, and turns back towards the below. That is nice and funny. You don't get free of it, but the upper cone comes and pulls your arms forward. But below, you long to return, only much more keenly, but you become doubled. Therefore you must become one. You must separate above and below, and go towards the lower sun from above. But there you are separated, and you must make a bridge between yourselves. Then the upper cone again comes completely towards the below. Therefore there is a line above, and it pushes you away below. Therefore one rushes forward. Since you have already become one there, the upper cone comes and catches its sun, swallows it, and it disappears. You fall over and strive again. You make a great prison below for the two sons, or for you both and a third. Then the fire comes down mightily, and attracts the lower cone to the above. That draws you back, and yet you long for the way forward, namely towards the serpent, that you have always liked so much. Because of the lower cone, you long for the serpent above. It crawls away to heaven over the lower sun, which stands in connection with the earth. But you must look further. The above must go down, and the below must go up, and yet be separated. There the upper cone leaves out its dark sun. You long for the lower sun behind you, but it is below the floor. Because you long to return, a hump grows on you in front. You make a solid floor below, and then curl around in the middle. Following this rune, Ha says to Yong and his soul, Still not enough? Now for once you can finally understand. Now, however, you make a bridge between you and the one who longs for the below. But the serpent crawls above and draws the sun up. Then both of you move above 
and want to go to the upper, but the sun is below and tries to draw you down. But you draw a line above the below and long for the above and are completely at one. The serpent comes and wants to drink from the vessel of the below, but there comes the upper cone and stops. Like the serpent, the longing goes forward again, and afterward you very much long to return. But the lower sun pulls, and thus you become balanced again. But soon you fall backward, since the one has reached out towards the upper sun. The other does not want this, and so you fall asunder. And therefore you must bind yourselves together three times. Then you stand upright again, and you hold both suns before you, as if they were your eyes. You hold the light of the above and the below before you and you stretch your arms out toward it, and you come together to become one, and must separate the two suns, and you long to return a little to the lower and reach forward towards the above. But the lower cone has swallowed the upper cone into itself because the suns were too close. Therefore you place the upper cone back up again, and because the lower cone is then no longer there, you want to draw it up again and have a profound longing for the lower cone while it is empty above, since the sun above the line is invisible. Because you have longed to re-return downward for so long, the upper cone comes down and tries to capture the invisible lower sun within itself. There the serpent's way goes completely above. You are split, and everything below is beneath the ground. You long towards the above again, but the lower longing already comes crawling like a serpent, and you build a prison over her. But there the lower cone comes up, you long to be at the very bottom, and the two suns suddenly reappear, close together. You long to return there, and come to be imprisoned. Then the one is defiant, and the other longs for the below. The prison door opens, the one longs even more to be below, but the defiant one above longs, and is no longer defiant, but longs for what is to come. And thus it comes to pass. The sun rises below, but it is imprisoned, and above three nested boxes are made for you, two in the upper sun, which you expect, but you have imprisoned the lower one. But now the upper cone comes down powerfully, and divides you and swallows the lower cone. This is impossible. Therefore you place the cones tip to tip, and curl up towards the front in the center, because that's no way to leave matters so it has to happen otherwise. The one attempts to reach upward, the other downward. You must do this with effort, since if the tips of the cones meet, they can hardly be separated anymore. Therefore I have placed a hard seed in between, tip to tip. That would be too beautifully regular. This pleases father and mother, but where does that leave me and my seed? Therefore a quick change of plans. One makes a bridge between you both, imprisons the lower sun again, the one longs for the above and the below, but the other longs especially strong for what's in front, above and below. Thus the future can become. See how well I can already say it. Yes, indeed, I am clever, cleverer than you. Since you have taken matters in hand so well, you also bring everything home under one roof, the serpent and both the sons. That is always most amusing. But you are separated, and because you have drawn the line above, the serpent and the sons are too far below. This happens because beforehand you curled around yourself from below. But you come together and into agreement and stand upright, because it is good and amusing and fine, and you say, thus shall it remain. But the upper cone already comes down because it felt dissatisfied that you had set a limit above beforehand. The above cone reaches out immediately for its sun, but nowhere is there a sun to be found anymore, and the serpent also jumps up to catch the suns. You fall over, and one of you is eaten by the lower cone. With the help of the upper cone, you get him out, and in return, you give the lower cone its sun, and the upper cone its as well. You cover things as the one-eyed does, who wanders in heaven and who holds the cones beneath you. But in the end, 
matters still go awry. You leave the cones and the suns for good to go, and stand side by side, and still do not want the same. In the end, you agree to bind yourself threefold to the upper cone, descending from above. I am called Ha Ha Ha, a jolly name. I am clever. Look here, my last sign. That is the magic of the white man who lives in the great magic houses, the magic which you call Christianity. Your medicine man said so himself. I and the Father are one. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I told you so. The upper cone is the Father. He has bound himself threefold to you and stands between the other and the Father. Therefore, the other must go through him if he wants to reach the cone. I'll begin our interpretation with a quote from the introduction to the Black Books, written by Sanu Shamdasani. Once he, Jung, had come to view his fantasies as having more than personal significance, he had come to see his undertaking as having wider relevance. On October 16th, 1916, he wrote to his colleague, the psychiatrist Alphonse Mader, I must find the way through the unconscious. People who have trusted me need my insight, not only I myself. Therefore, I had to exclusively dedicate myself to this work, which was very time-consuming and terribly demanding. In order to begin to grasp the ruins, I want to highlight a few key symbols within. But before, I want to get into a myth that speaks directly on what we've just witnessed. The myth is Odin of Norse mythology. For those unfamiliar, here's a quick summary. At the center of the Norse cosmos stands the great tree, Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil's upper branch cradle, Asgard, the home and fortress of the Aesir gods and goddesses, of whom Odin is the chief. Yggdrasil grows out of the well of Erd. A pool whose fathomless depths hold many of the most powerful forces and beings in the cosmos. Among these beings are the Norns, three sagacious maidens who create the fates of all beings. One of the foremost techniques they use to shape fate is carving runes into Yggdrasil's trunk. The symbols then carry these intentions throughout the tree, affecting everything in the nine worlds. Odin watched the Norns from his seat in Asgard and envied their powers and their wisdom, and he bent his will towards the task of coming to know the runes. Since the runes' native home is the well of Erd with the Norns, and since the runes do not reveal themselves to anyone but those who prove themselves worthy of such fearful insights and abilities, Odin hung himself from a branch of Yggdrasil pierced himself with his spear, and peered downward into the shadowy waters below. He forbade any of the other gods to grant him the slightest aid, not even a sip of water, and stared downward and called to the runes. He survived in this state, teetering on the precept that separates the living from the dead for no less than nine days and nights. At the end of the ninth night, he at last perceived shapes in the depths, the runes. They had accepted his sacrifice and shown themselves to him, revealing to him not only their form, but also the secrets that lie within them. Having fixed this knowledge in his formidable memory, Odin ended his ordeal with a scream of exhaustion. Having been initiated into the mysteries of the runes, Odin recounted, then I was fertilized and became wise. I truly grew and thrived. From a word to a word, I was led to a word. From a work to a work, I was led to a work. Equipped with the knowledge of how to wield the runes, he became one of the mightiest and most accomplished beings in the cosmos. He learned chants that enabled him to heal emotional and bodily wounds, to blind his enemies and render their weapons worthless, to free himself from constraints, to put out fires, to expose and banish practitioners of malevolent magic, to protect his friends in battle, 
to wake the dead, to win and keep a lover, and to perform many other feats like these. This myth is a beautiful analogy to what we've covered throughout this video. So with that, I'll add some symbols and ideas to look towards when interpreting the ruins as we proceed to the conclusion of the video. Before discussing cones and circles, I do want to bring forth a quote in Jung's collected works that is fitting for what Ha just translated. In the work titled Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche, Jung writes, Since the psyche and matter are contained in one and the same world, and moreover are in continuous contact with one another, and ultimately rest on irrepresentable, transcendental factors, it is not only possible, but fairly probable even, that psyche and matter are two different aspects of one and the same thing. The synchronicity phenomena point, it seems to me, in this direction, for they show that the non-psychic can behave like the psychic, and vice versa, without there being any causal connection between them. Our present knowledge does not allow us to do much more than compare the relation of the psychic to the material world with two cones, whose apices, meeting at a point without extension, a real zero point, touch and do not touch. The previous quote brings us to a symbol within the runes which come up throughout Ha's interpretation. The cone or cones represent two opposites, say upper and lower, or heaven and earth, or in the quote I just read, mind and body. Opposites are not different, as one cannot be without the other. For example, there is no up without a down. And this is different from saying there cannot be an up without a left, as up and left are not opposites, rather they're different, just as the color gold is different from blue. So while up may have many things that are different from it, there is only one other that makes it its opposite. And that makes opposites quite unique. And much of Jung's psychological work, as well as one's own existence, proves the opposing nature of the psyche. And we should thank these opposites, as difficult as they can be to bear, because in my humble opinion, without the opposites, there will be no life, no energy, no vibration, no consciousness. In addition to cones, we see circles or suns brought up frequently throughout the ruins. Usually a circle or sun is attributed to God, or in this case, gods. One could even say psychic forces. And it's important to note that each cone has its sun, its specific force. And with these two simple facts to keep an eye on, another listen to the ruins may start bringing more information within you forth to explore. And while looking through these cones and circles in the ruins, one may notice a movement and the resulting effects from it. And it is just these movements that I want to quickly discuss. If there was ever something which is still yet moves, it is consciousness. We discuss the opposites and their significance, providing consciousness its consciousness, and it is just this idea which comes up throughout the runes. It is a bit more subtle than saying the upper cone of the sun, as Ha doesn't mention the movement specifically, but if you take a look at the runes as a whole, it is one movement. They're scenes, say scenes of consciousness moving itself. We see the ego, the unconscious, and various other psychic forces, such as the serpent, playing out these movements throughout the runes. When listening back to the runes, key in on key words such as longing, or drawling, or making a prison, or any type of movement. A quick and simple example of this can be found in rune 4. Ha says, you lift yourself over the line of the earth and tumble over. That's why you long suddenly for the below and want to lift up from the below because you hang from the above. In this short sentence, we could see an ego consciously moving its way. This archetype of movement can play out in a million different forms, but the beauty of these ruins is it's showing its archetypal movement, the essence. So we could see in this one short example 
how we can find such archetypal movements of consciousness. Besides these movements, there are also positions. In the first ruin especially, we see two positions, diagonal and straight, as well as this idea of straight continuing in most of the runes. This seems rather straightforward, diagonal being off balance and straight in balance, but I want to look back at the first rune where we see a moment of straightness becoming the cause for a recoil. The two diagonals, whoever, are you yourself. The circle is the sun. One has the sun, the other doesn't. That's why you are diagonal. However, there must be one that stands straight and goes over the bridge, but that leaves the two suns behind it and becomes straight. That is why it has to go under again and coil around itself. Then it has the sun in the belly of the upper cone. It will stay longer with this, but the other longs for the second sun. For one to leave two suns behind, it could be seen as the ego striving into the world without a sense of its forces, itself, of shadows, of its roots. And it's forced to re-return, coiling around itself, resulting in the sun in the belly of the upper cone. But its other, say the shadow, longs for the other sun, the sun below. You can see in this example that one went over the bridge and it became straight, but since it left the suns behind, it had to recoil. Why I point this out is because these ruins are not as straightforward as one would hope them to be. But again, sitting with them and allowing them to come through will help capture their enigmatic meaning. Overall, I believe this is a great exercise for consciousness, a true mental yoga on the opposites. I know as I meditated on the ruins, I began seeing the ruins play out in various scenes. They became alive, and I could see how the manifestations, the forms or myths, which may result from certain scenes, may be endless. Again, the scenes portraying archetypal psychic movements. And speaking on this idea of movements and mental yoga, I found the translators of the black books highlight just this point in a section of the introduction titled Translating Jung's Ruins, to which Martin Liebscher, John Peck, and Sanu Shamdasani wrote, The skeptics scoff at ruins, objecting that whatever projections one might bring to such symbols, they are arbitrary. Yet a handful do resemble certain bodily postures or stances, which could be described as a form of rune yoga. One justifiably supposes, however, that Jung's respect for their shapes is warranted if only because the myth about their origin and Wotan's sacrifice of himself to himself casts them as a donum dei, a gift of God emerging as they do in his active imagination with Ha. Translation from a runic primal layer gives weight to these signs as basic to the human psyche. Rune yoga, in this light, emerges from the black books as a means to sort out such autonomous creative psychic events. Such events are difficult to understand, but the burden of misunderstanding is greater. A symbol in rune yoga is nearly the same as what it pictures. One, it is understood as the mimicry of a right attitude on the level of both spiritual and instinct, both being archly rooted, both being archaically rooted. Another point I'll add that helped in my approach to these ruins was actually drawing them out. While it is Ka, the soul of Ha, who provides these ruins and dresses the gods in marble, adding matter to spirit, there is something to writing these ruins out and creating them into matter yourself. While you don't have to go to the lengths of carving them in stone, although it may be powerful, just a simple pen and paper may get new insights flowing. And finally, I want to say something that I've said in previous videos, as well as earlier in this video, and that is that the inner work is paradoxical. To even call it work is a misservice. Because most of the time, it's not the actual work you do that is using your mind and knowledge to figure things out. It's about merely becoming familiar with what's in front and allowing it to complete the job. That's the work, and that's how these ruins should become clear to you. 
be an Odin, hang with them. Don't let yourself get in your own way. This is why I haven't tried to add any more opinion or break down the ruins section by section. If Jung is speaking from the collective, if these ruins are from that collective of us, then it is in us all and should begin to see itself. I began this video with a specific message, a message which this video continued to play off. That is the fact that we've lost the ability to see in the dark, to look past the illusion into the truth of the matter. The soul, the psyche, is a space to be respected, as it is. While the thoughts, feelings, and visions which arise from this space may go against anything you've ever imagined, without it, you're in a category few would want to venture. That's being soulless. So rather than a flashy conclusion, a nice little synchronicity, an exciting story, I'll leave you with a simple question our age should truly be asking. What's the point in outer progress? What's the point of all this technology if there's no soul in the matter? I hope this video helps one catch the point of Jung's work. He's not asking you to follow him, to call for Ka, Ha, or any of the figures Jung experienced. Rather, use this experience as a means to realize your own darkness, your own unconscious, your own forms, so that it may have a channel to come through. Jung speaks of living life throughout the red and black books, and this is the life he lived, not only outside, but also within. A life all may live if one just puts a little soul in the matter. I thank you all for the continued support and look forward to reading the comments on your thoughts on the ruins. Please like and share this video to help this content reach others. And until next time, stay humble.